Please note that filming text on the whiteboard requires extremely bright studio lighting. Subsequently, sunglasses were worn during the filming of this video to prevent damage to my retinas. A note on how to use these sessions. Jot down the notes as we go, so we'll help you learn the material in a more interactive way and you can use in a study note later. Also, in the small chance that the discrepancy arises between the professor's notes and mine, always go with your professor. They're the one grading you. Lastly, any examples or analogies used in the session are not meant to support or criticize politics, religion, or lifestyle. They're merely learning tools to help understand the material. Alright, guys and girls. It's time to get cracking. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about carboxylic acids and the derivatives of carboxylic acids. And this is a really important chapter in organic chemistry because carboxylic acids are one of the most useful compounds we have in organic chemistry. Why is this the case? Well, it's because carboxylic acids are very flexible compounds, meaning that you not only can turn many different types of compounds into carboxylic acids, but you can also turn carboxylic acids into many different types of compounds. And this is really useful if you ever want to interconvert between two types of compounds. For example, say you have one compound like an amide. And you want to turn this amide into a different type of compound, let's say an ester, for example. The problem with this is there is no way to turn an amide directly into an ester. There is no successful reaction for doing this. So what we can do is use a carboxylic acid as a middleman. So take your amide, turn it into a carboxylic acid, and since the carboxylic acid is so flexible, you can then use that carboxylic acid to make the ester that you want. Okay, so you're gonna take your amide, turn it into a carboxylic acid, and then use that carboxylic acid to make the ester that you're looking for. And this is pretty much the same deal as if you've ever flown before. A lot of times your local airport can't fly you to the place you want to go to directly, but what it can do is fly you to a larger airport that can get you to your final destination. For example, a couple years ago, I was at the Long Beach airport trying to get a flight to London. However, Long Beach doesn't fly directly to London, so what I had to do was book a flight from Long Beach to LAX, which is an international airport, and then from LAX, I could fly to London. And this is exactly what carboxylic acids do for different types of compounds. They act like airport hubs. So carboxylic acids, you're going to fly into them from one type of compound and then fly out of them to whatever type of compound you want to go to, okay? And this process of going from one compound through carboxylic acid to another type of compound is known as interconversion. So I went ahead and drew up a diagram here for you to show you that carboxylic acids can be used to interconvert between all these different types of carboxylic acid derivatives. You've got acid chlorides, acid anhydrides, esters, amides, and carboxylates. These are all carboxylic acid derivatives, meaning that they can all be derived, they can all be made from a carboxylic acid. And you can also make a carboxylic acid from all these different types of derivatives, okay? So if you don't understand what this means for right now, that's fine, I didn't want you to. I just want you to understand the gist of why carboxylic acids are so important. And they're important because they can be used to interconvert between many different types of compounds, okay? So how this lesson is gonna lay out is, we're gonna first start by talking about general features of carboxylic acids and their derivatives. This will include the structure and reactivity. And then we'll finally get to interconversion of carboxylic acids and all their derivatives, okay? So let's go ahead and get started with general features. Okay, so let's start by talking about the structure of carboxylic acids and their derivatives. And carboxylic acids and their derivatives belong to a general category of compounds known as carbonyl compounds. Okay, so let's write this down. That carboxylic acids and their derivatives, these are part of a larger category of compounds known as carbonyl compounds. And carbonyl compounds, these are just compounds that have a C double bonded to an oxygen in them. And we've seen examples of these before. Do you guys remember? Aldehydes and ketones are examples of carbonyl compounds. Okay, so we've already seen one type of carbonyl compound before, which were 
aldehydes and ketones. We're now going to be dealing with another type of carbonyl compound here, which is carboxylic acids and their derivatives. carboxylic acids and their derivatives. Okay, so since both of these are part of a general category of carbonyl compounds, they're gonna share many similarities in common. However, there will be one key difference between this type of carbonyl compound and this type of carbonyl compound, and we're gonna see this in just a second. Okay, so whether you're dealing with this type of carbonyl compound or this type of carbonyl compound, all carbonyl compounds will have this in common. Okay, so all carbonyl compounds will have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, a carbonyl, with an alkyl group coming off this side and another substituent coming off this side, which I'm gonna denote with a question mark for now. It's this substituent coming off of this carbonyl that's going to distinguish this type of carbonyl compound from this type of carbonyl compound. And you're gonna find out all about this in a little bit. But for now, I wanna concentrate on the similarities between these two, and then we'll find out about the differences, okay? So, all carbonyl compounds will have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. An oxygen is more electronegative than a carbon. So that means this oxygen will be pulling electrons away from this carbon, making this oxygen partially negative and this carbon partially positive, right? So that means this carbon is getting its electrons pulled away from it, making this carbon electron deficient, making this carbon into a electrophile, right? So you guys, so go ahead and draw a little arrow right here and designate this carbon as an electrophile because this oxygen is pulling electrons away from this carbon making it electron deficient. So this carbon's like, hey, I wish somebody would come and attack me, so share some electrons with me because I'm an electrophile, right? So this is gonna be an electrophile and this implies that a nucleophile will attack here to share electrons with that electrophile, okay? Okay, so anytime you see a carbonyl compound, you should just automatically be thinking, hey, this oxygen's pulling electrons away from this carbon, making this carbon electron deficient, making it an electrophile. So it's very likely that a nucleophile will come and attack this carbon of the carbonyl, whether you're dealing with this type of carbonyl compound or this type of carbonyl compound. Both of these are just carbonyl compounds, meaning that they're gonna have a carbonyl that a nucleophile is going to come and attack. Okay, so that's how these two types of carbonyl compounds are similar. Let me now show you what's going to differentiate this type of carbonyl compound from this type of carbonyl compound. Okay, so let's just take an example of this type of carbonyl compound and compare it to an example of this type of carbonyl compound so we can see the difference between these two. Okay, so let me go ahead and just take a ketone, for example. And a ketone will have the traditional carbonyl half of a carbonyl compound, but what's its question mark substituent gonna be? It's gonna be an alkyl group for a ketone, right? So let me go ahead and just put a CH3 alkyl group here, for example. And let's compare this to a carboxylic acid or a carboxylic acid derivative, okay? So I'm just gonna take an acid chloride, for example. And an acid chloride will have the carbonyl half of a carbonyl compound, but what's its question mark substituent gonna be? Well, the acid chloride is a carboxylic acid derivative that will have a chlorine coming off of this carbonyl. Okay, so, so far, when you take a look at these two types of carbonyl compounds, they shouldn't look that much different. They both have carbons of the carbonyl that are gonna be electrophiles, that are gonna be attacked by nucleophiles. Yes, this one does have a CH3 substituent, this one does have a chlorine substituent, but it doesn't look like these two are that much different from each other right now. But let's see how they're going to react in a reaction. Okay, so let's go ahead and just throw in some nucleophiles here. So throw in a nucleophile up here, 
and a nucleophile down here, and let's have these react with both of these types of carbonyl compounds. It should react the same way initially because all that's going to happen is it's going to add to the carbon of the carbonyl in both of these cases. Okay, so. Okay, so this carbon of the carbonyl is saying, hey, I need some electrons because oxygen is taking them away from me. Nucleophile, can you come add to me and share some electrons? And this nucleophile is like, sure, I can come share some electrons with you. Attack that carbon of the carbonyl, kick the electrons up to that oxygen. This will kick an extra lone pair up to this oxygen, which will put a negative charge on that oxygen. And this nucleophile will just have come to add to this carbon. Okay, so that's what would happen if a nucleophile added to a ketone. Let's see what will happen if it adds to a carboxylic acid derivative. Okay, so this carbon of the carbonyl is like, hey, I don't have enough electrons. Oxygen is taking them away from me. Somebody give me some electrons. This nucleophile is like, hey, I got you carbon. Don't worry. It's going to attack that carbon of the carbonyl just like we saw up here, kick the electrons up to the oxygen. And this is going to do the exact same reaction we saw happen with the ketone a couple seconds ago. So it'll kick the extra electron pair up to the oxygen, putting a negative charge on that oxygen. And now this nucleophile will just have come to add to this carbon. Okay, so, so far, these two types of carbonyl compounds have reacted identically. So it's like, hey, what's the big deal? It looks like they react the exact same way. Well, it's at this step that these two types of carbonyl compounds are going to differ. Okay, so Check it out, when we added a nucleophile to a carbonyl, it kicked the electrons up to the oxygen, putting a negative charge on that oxygen. We said we were almost done with this reaction, we just had to clean up that negative charge on the oxygen. And how did we clean up a negative charge on the oxygen? By protonating it, right? So what we did was, we added in some acid, some H3O+, and this would come and protonate this oxygen to cancel out that negative charge and turn that compound into an alcohol. And this was our end product of a nucleophile adding to a carbonyl when it was an aldehyde or a ketone. You'd end up with an alcohol. Let's see what the difference is for when we attack a carboxylic acid or a carboxylic acid derivative. Okay, so here, same thing happened in the first step. Nucleophile acid carbonyl kicked the electrons up to the oxygen. We have a negative charge on the oxygen. And we're like, hey, we're almost done with this reaction. We just have to clean up the negative charge on an oxygen. And how do we clean up a negative charge on an oxygen? Well, before we saw that the way you clean up a negative charge in an oxygen was by protonating it. And you can indeed protonate this oxygen if you want also to clean up that negative charge. However, this right here is going to bring up a second way to clean up a negative charge on an oxygen, which is to reform this carbonyl and kick off a leaving group. Okay, so check out what you can do here. You can either protonate this oxygen like you saw up here to get an alcohol as your end product, or you can have a second option here, which we didn't have when we attacked aldehydes or ketones. And this second option is to reform the carbonyl and kick off a leaving group. And why can we do this, you guys? Why can we reform the carbonyl and kick off a leaving group in this case, and we couldn't in this case? Well, check out what kind of substituents you have on the carbon of the carbonyl. Here you have a CH3, here you have a chlorine. And is chlorine a good or a bad leaving group? Chlorine's a halogen, which makes it an awesome leaving group, right, you guys? So chlorine can leave and be stable on its own. If you try to do this reaction with an aldehyde or a ketone, if you try to reform a carbonyl here and kick off CH3 as a leaving group, that would kick off CH3 as CH3 minus. And is this stable or unstable, you guys? This is really, really unstable. A negative charge on a carbon is really reactive. So CH3 in a good or a bad leaving group? It's a horrible leaving group, right, you guys? So this could not happen. You could not reform the carbonyl and kick off a leaving group here because you didn't have a good leaving group. But whenever you're dealing with carboxylic acids and their derivatives, you will have a good leaving group or you'll have something you can convert into a good leaving group, okay? So in this case, we're dealing with an acid chloride. A chlorine is already a good leaving group.